summertime is the annoyance between spring and fall. Amen? Now, some people like it. That's all well and good. I can, I can actually remember a, uh, about, it was this time of year because I remember on July 4th, we were having celebrations and we were outside shooting fireworks and we were wearing heavy jackets. This has been in the 90s. We were at Monica and Roberts and we were all wearing jackets because the temperature was lower 60s, upper 50s. After the sun went down. I remember that. Oh, those were the good old days. Can I hear you say amen? Amen. I've got some notes here. I don't want to forget my notes. <clears throat> Take your Bibles, if you would. First Corinthians, if you don't mind. And if you do, you're going to be really annoyed for quite a while. Uh, let's see here. I've just completely lost where I was going to be this morning. What did we talk about last Sunday? The Bible. Um... Four or five? Okay. Why don't I see what I'm looking for here? No, that doesn't look familiar to me. Why doesn't it? Hang on a second. I'll get here in a minute. No, it's in chapter 3. I remember now. All right, I see it. First Corinthians chapter 3. <clears throat> dealing with um, Paul talked about him and Apollos and uh, we, were get, we were dealing with uh, he's talking about a husbandman over a vineyard over a farm or a plantation of some kind and um, then he kind of switches here he says in, um, in verse 5 1 Corinthians chapter 3 who then is Paul and who is Apollos but ministers by whom you believed even as the Lord gave to every man. I have planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. The New, Te the New Testament will teach you that everybody who is a born-again believer, everybody who is a truly born-again believer, we are all priests. We are all kings. Okay? Um, we all have, everybody in this room, has the, has the ability to read, study, learn what the Scripture says, and know it. Does everybody follow me? Okay? And I want you to kind of see this for what it is. And Paul is laying part of this out. It's part of the, what we call the foundation of the church and the foundation of doctrine. And that's kind of where I'm going this morning. With some, we're going to talk about probably foundations for a couple Sundays. Uh, and, and how the Bible teaches about laying foundations and good quality foundations. <clears throat> but um, Paul, Paul said, I'm, I'm, I'm nothing but Paul. Apollos is nothing but Apollos. And uh, it's God is the one who gives the increase. And Paul is teaching that the human agents who are preaching or teaching the gospel are not as important as God or the gospel is. We're nothing. Men come and go. Teachers come and go. Preachers come and go. Evangelists come and go. But God is the important one here. And here's what, here's what he's getting at. Okay? The Roman Catholic Church and others now are joining in in this deal. Are, have, have maintained for 15, 1700 years, something like that, that the common man does not have the ability. What they call the profane person. That would be, that would be you. You're profane. Okay? You're the, you're the vulgar person. You are not of the office of the priest or the bishop or the cardinal or the pope. It's useless to get a, put a Bible in your hand 
because, number one, more than likely, you're so uneducated, you wouldn't be able to read it. Number two, even if you did read it, you don't have the sanction to be able to understand it or to figure out what it says. And so, here is Roman Catholicism. Hand it over. You don't need it. So, you just do what I tell you to do. You obey me. And if I tell you that God said this, then you just believe that God said this. Is that washed with you? No. Notice it was my mother-in-law that spoke up first on that deal. Okay? Everybody in here, you got a Bible? Okay? This is your Bible. This is your Bible. Read it. Memorize it. Meditate on it. Think about it. Learn it. Understand it. Get wisdom from it. And if a man, and it doesn't matter if it's a tall man or a short man, or a fat man or a skinny man, it doesn't matter if they're wearing a suit and tie or a robe with a backwards collar, it doesn't matter if they have a high office or a low office, if it doesn't matter if they have a radio ministry, a TV ministry, a DVD ministry, it doesn't matter. If a man says one thing, and you read in the Bible where it says another, then the man is wrong every time. And God, let God be true. And every man a liar. And that, that, that in the Bible is a right that God has given you as a New Testament believer. You have the ability... To read, think, understand, comprehend the scriptures on your own. And so that's why he says here, uh, uh, he said, Who then is Paul and who is Apollos, but ministers by which ye believed, even as the Lord gave to every man. And Paul wasn't teaching anything other than the gospel truth. And he says, I have planted Apollos water, but God is the one who gave the increase. Now, there is an office of bishop over a church. That's... That's all. Somebody's got to be, there's got to be somebody who's sitting in the driver's seat, steering the car. Amen? Now, Mama might have some good advice every now and then on when and where to pull over. Amen? Okay? But somebody's got to be sitting in the seat. So anyway, that, that's just, but that's nothing right now. All right? So anyway, so we have a vineyard, had this idea of a vineyard. And then he says... Um, in verse 9, for we are laborers together with God, you are God's husbandry, and you are God's building. Now he's kind of switching over a little bit. He's going to get into, let me tell you where we're headed here. Uh, in verse 16, know you not that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. He's going to eventually get into the idea that you yourself are the temple of God. This church building is not the temple of God. We refer to it as the house of God. I'm going to go to the house of God. This is a building that we have set aside for the purpose of meeting together, of worshiping God, of singing psalms and hymns and so on. But this building itself is not the temple of God or the tabernacle of God or the house of God. Uh, again, uh, Catholic doctrine says that the physical building of the church itself is necessary for man's salvation. In other words, you have to be in there. You have to what ha, what is done to you has to be done. In fact, they even have a they even have a way, and I and, and I don't know if we just borrowed this or just it's just common sense, uh, but you can kind of see it in this church. Uh, if you look at the aisleway of this church here, coming down this way and then right here and then up on the stage, it kind of makes a cross, doesn't it? Okay. Now, I have never said to anybody, come down here and stand right here, because there's a blessing right here in this little area right here. Now, if you're over here, you can't get the blessing. Or if you go over there somewhere, you can't get the blessing. I don't even think that if God's dealing with it, that you have to come down to the altar, the mourner's bench, or whatever it is. I don't think you have to come down here to get what God's going to give you. How many of you agree with that? Say amen. Okay. I, I think it probably is good every now and then for you to come down and sob and bend your knee. 
Amen. I think that's good for us to get together every now and then or take somebody by the hand and just come. I believe in that. But I don't think that you this this is not some magical place. I've seen I've seen YouTube videos of of some of these pastors that are that had this spirit thing going. And they'll tell people, oh, walk through here. Boy, it's real. the Spirit is real strong right here. Boy, if you walk through, you feel that? Oh, yeah, I feel that. Boy, it's really strong right here. That's called geomancy. Let me explain to you what geomancy is. The word mancy has to do with magic. Geo has to do with geography. And geomancy says that if you stand in the right place in a certain area... Then you can, there's powers there and you can perform magic or you can get magic or you can do whatever. That's geomancy. And so for, for any church or anybody to say, oh, if you come in here now in this sacred building, God is strong and powerful here. That's, that's, what, that's geomancy. It's what it is. It says that God is limited to a specific location and he's not. Muslims believe that they must do what five times a day? What must they do five times a day? Face Mecca, because Mecca is the magical place that if they're not turned in that direction, there's, there's an app now for iPhones, iPads, or any, anything else that actually, number one, reminds them when it's time to pray, and number two, will, wherever they are in the world, it'll point them in the direction of Mecca so they don't get it wrong. And if, you're fa- and if you make a mistake and face the wrong direction, you have transgressed in the eyes of Allah. And you need to have, I don't know what they provide for cleansing or whatever. But it's, it's geomancy. It's what it is. But in the Roman Catholic Church, I don't know if you've ever noticed this. When they have a funeral, where do they bring the casket to? This spot right here. Because it represents what's called a cross point. And they have to put it. Right here. Can't be over to the side somewhere. Can't be. It has to be right here in order for, I don't know, whatever it is. But anyway, in order for the magic to work in the Catholic Church, it has to be right there. That's geomancy is what it is. Okay? Really? Have to. Wow. Then they sprinkle water on it. That saves them, right? Let me tell you something. It's just better to just believe the Bible. And, and, it, and, if you're, and if you're sitting outside on the porch while we're in here having church, can God deal with you out there? Absolutely. If you're sitting out in the woods one day, amen. If you're, hey, if you're out fishing something Sunday and, and the Holy Ghost comes visit you, can he do that? Say amen. Amen. And now he'll tell you to get in the house of God. Amen. He'll tell you to get in some fellowship. But anyway, God can work anywhere and in any place because God does not dwell in temples made with hands. He does not dwell there. He dwells in the, in the temple of the believer. He lives right here. In fact, God has even built for himself a throne in my heart, including the sea of glass, which is the pericardium. And the seven spirits of God, which is the two lungs, and the 24 elders, which are the rib cage. The whole thing is right here. God has actually designed a better temple than what we built in this place. So that's where he's going with this. But, he's, but every building starts with a foundation. The Bible teaches us that if the foundations be destroyed, wherewith shall the righteous stand? And I want to tell you something, in this country, the foundations are being destroyed in, in a massive way. The foundations are being destroyed. And if you think this health care debate is just nothing more than who's going to pay, you know, for some snotty-nosed kid's broken arm, you're wrong. It is, it is a very spiritual thing that is going on in our country. We're losing our rights. And you say, what? well, we can, I, we can do whatever we want to. I want to tell you something. You're losing your right to your own money, That's right. your own property. And if you look in, at what God did with Israel when he led them out of Egypt and led them into Canaan land, you know what the first thing God did? He gave them rights to property. Yeah. 
Gave them rights to own things and have it as their own and keep it. Did you know the Israelites did not pay a tax to the king? The only thing they were required to do was pay a tithe so that the Levite priests could live while they performed the function of God. That's all they, that's all they did. They didn't have a car tax or a, or a donkey tax or a cow tax or a wheat tax or a barley tax or a tent tax. They didn't have anything like that. And, and God had already written their health care into the Bible. Okay? And I'm just, I'm just telling, and God, and God even had a plan in the law for, for, for helping poor people out. It was all there in the law. But Israel decided that they wanted one ruler to rule over them, a king. And in this country right now, we're, we're like, I don't know how many steps away, but we're very close to having a king. In the United States of America. Very close. Okay? Anyway, I don't want to get off. Anyway, the foundations are being destroyed in our country. They're being destroyed in our homes. Being destroyed in our churches and so on. And I just want to kind of deal just, I don't know, I doubt very serious I'll get through it all this morning. But I'm going to deal with foundations. So I want you to look in uh, verse 10. The Bible says, according to the grace of God which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation. And another buildeth thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. Now look at verse 11. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. So I want you to think about just realms of life. Let's talk about your personal life. Let's talk about your ideas, your character, your philosophy. Your outlook at your politics, your finances, how you deal with your wife or your husband, how you deal with your kids. These are all issues that must have a, a solid foundation of some kind or another. If, if you were to say, well, um, I, I think, let me just, it, it, if you were to say, well, I think the government should tax everybody about 80%, by the we only need 20% to live on anyway. I'm going to ask you, what is the basis for your thinking? And that word basis is a foundation word. What is the basis for your thinking? What is the basis for the government thinking that they can impose this new tax upon everybody? What is the basis for that? It's not a free system that's based on. It's based on socialism. Socialism and communism. Socialism, Reg calls it the unhatched egg of communism. I'll say communism is socialism grown up. Okay? It's the same idea. That's the basis for it, and it's a faulty, it's a faulty foundation. Show me where in the last 100 years that communism has worked very, very well. Show, show me the place where it's, where it's worked. Did it work? Has it worked in Cuba? No. Has it worked in China? No. China's more capitalist than what they want to admit. Has, did it work in the Soviet Union? Is it working right now in North Korea? It's not. There's no place where communism works for any extended period of time. And yet, for some reason, the socialists and communists still think that America would be the perfect place to try it out. To see if it's gonna, actually going to work. And it won't work here because it didn't work anywhere else. It is a faulty foundation that's not designed to work. And so because the foundation of Jesus Christ is destroyed out of this nation, this what happens when the what happens when the basement cracks? What happens? Jim, what happens? The house will fall down. There's no doubt about it. It's built because God designed gravity. And that house is sitting on something. Keith here, you do excavating, don't you? Okay? And you know about when you're, when you're digging out a place where they're going to build something, whether it's a roadway or a house or a building or something like that, there's, if, if you don't get that thing right, and they don't put that footing in right, and they don't put that foundation in right, you can just call it off. Amen? Who remembers that, um, that hotel in Kansas City back in the, what was the early 80s? The Hyatt Regency in Kansas City. They built two walkways in this, in this hotel, and they was having some big wing ding there, and hundreds of people were on these walkways, 
And they collapsed and killed, I don't know, hundreds some odd people. Mostly elderly people. They were having some kind of little ball there and just killed them. And what they found out was, was that the person who built that thing was trying to save money. And he used cheap materials that were weak and were not strong enough to hold the amount of people that was on there. And he cheated is what he did. He did not build the foundation right and therefore the house fell. The thing fell. And it just makes common sense that if we don't get our foundations right, okay, if we don't get our foundations right, why are we trying to build on something that's not right? Why are we trying to build on something that is not Jesus Christ? Now, there's a remedy. If you, if you start to examine your life right now, you start to examine your personal life, your relationships, you start to examine your finances, start to examine how you run your home, start to examine how you work. Start, let's, let's examine this church. I mean, let's just put everything out here on the table and let's just take a look at it and let's do a basement inspection. Let's look at the foundation. And if the foundation of something is not right, it's not too late to bring in some old bulldozer somewhere and plow it down and start all over again. It's not too late. It is never too late to, to start over with a brand new foundation. Yes, it's going to take work. That's what he's talking about here in this passage. Paul planted Apollos water. Did you know that that's work? It takes work to preach. It takes work to evangelize. It takes work to sow seed. It takes work to do that. It takes work to have a church and maintain a church. It takes work for you as an individual Christian to maintain the life that you want to live in Christ. It takes work. But I'm telling you, if you'll get the foundation right, that work will be a whole lot easier, number one. And have you ever tried to nail on a board that was not, did not have something underneath it? What happens? Boing! And you'll work yourself to death trying to nail into a board that does not have something underneath it. it just, it, it, it'll kill you. And what I'm saying to you is, get, get a good, solid, biblical foundation of every area of your life or at some point you'll find out what Solomon found out that it's vanity vexation man had a thousand women he could sleep with had all the wine had all the women had all the food had all the nations bound to him. he had everything that a man could want that's why God raised Solomon up did you know that you stop and think about it men every man in this world is chasing something down whether it's the the ultimate high of getting drunk or taking drugs or the ultimate experience with a woman or, or, or the power that a man can have by owning everything that is around him or the wealth, having the most money. Every man in this world is chasing those things down in his life as like the ultimate thing. And Solomon had every bit of it all in one man. Had all the women, had all the wine, had all the food, had all the taxes paid to him, had all the wealth, had the biggest house. He had all the nations of the world scared to death to go against Israel. His enemies were coming and bowing down to him. Talk about a rush. And he lived that way for 40 years. And when he got done, he just shook his head and he wrote out the book of Ecclesiastes. And he said, I'm telling you, I've been, I've been young and now I'm old and I'm telling you it's vanity. You're wasting your time. You will never gain the thrill that you think you're going to get out of these things. And eventually, you're still going to go to the same place that everybody else does, and that is to the grave. Same place. So anyway, it starts with the foundation. Let me, let me pull my notes out here. And I had uh, worked on these last night, and I forgot to print them out. And uh, take your Bible, if you would. And uh, let me just, I, I'm just going to go a lot of places uh, throughout this study. Take your Bible, turn to the book of Ezra, if you would. That's before the book of Psalms, Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, Job, Psalms. So go back to Ezra. And let's just kind of look at this for a minute. Now, let me just kind of tell you, uh, one of the, when, I, when I did this study, I was just kind of putting some ideas together. It was more of like a... Um, like a prophecy related study and so on. Let me just kind of tell you the, the, the overall plan of what's going on right now. Okay. Um, God right now 
is laying a foundation for his millennial reign kingdom. Okay? Now I want you to think about that. Christ, I mean literally Christ, and when I say Christ, I do not mean Barack Obama. Okay? Or Michael Jackson or Elvis Presley. All right? Christ is going to come and he is going to, he's going to establish his kingdom on this earth and he will be in charge and he will be using his glorified saints uh, who come back with him to rule and reign over the earth. For, I, I cannot even, I mean, I love to see pictures of that in the Bible, but it, it's just beyond my, my fathoming. We have lived so long in such a terrible mess in the world for 6,000 years. That to actually think that there's going to be a time on this earth when all the nations are going to be at peace. They will literally beat their swords into plowshares. Okay? Which means instead of spending money and effort and time on warfare, we're actually doing something productive like growing fields and feeding people. Okay? And let me just, let me put our politics aside just for a minute. We spent like $82 billion over in Iraq, something like that. I read something the other day that if we would have just taken half of that money, we could have fed, clothed, and provided for just about every human being on the planet with that money. Okay? And we, listen, we're, we're removed from it here in America, but I can tell you, I've been elsewhere. I can tell you there are kids who are running it. They ain't got nothing. And I don't mean they ain't got an iPod and $400 shoes. I mean, they don't have anything. They'd be lucky if they get a meal today. Okay? I'm telling you, that, that's not right. Now, I'm not trying to turn this all into liberal socialists. But what I'm telling you is, in the millennial reign of Christ, that will not, I don't think that will exist at all. I think, I think people are going to be fed. I think, I think it's going to be peace. For a thousand years on this earth. And wouldn't that be great? Somebody say amen. Anyway. But right now. Right now. The foundation of the millennial reign is being laid. Okay. And I want you to pick. Now Paul used that language of a foundation. And he, and he said that Christ is the foundation. Later on. And we may run into the verse, this verse here in a little bit. Later on he talks about the foundation of the twelve apostles. And Jesus Christ being the chief cornerstone. I believe what the scripture says. Okay. Now, Roman Catholicism will tell you that the foundation is actually built upon one apostle and that was Peter. That's not right. That is not what the Bible says. It says it was built upon the foundation of the twelve apostles and Christ being the chief cornerstone. Christ operated through those twelve men alone to set the tone and the theme uh, for the church. In Ezra chapter 3, look at verse 6. Uh, look at the language. Just, just kind of, we're going to kind of do a little language study in the Bible this morning. From the first day of the seventh month, uh, Ezra chapter 3, verse 6. From the first day of the seventh month began they to offer burnt offerings unto the Lord. But the foundation of the temple of the Lord was not yet laid. Now, it, Ezra deals with the time now when Israel has been scattered into captivity. After the 70 years, they're allowed to come back into the land. They look and they don't have a temple. And they need a temple because their, their whole religion requires temple sacrifices. I mean, that's what the law required. It, there, there must, we must have that going on. So when they come back, they cannot honor God and keep the law the way God requires it because they don't have a temple. And so anyway, uh, they come, they're, they're, going to have to, they're going to have to build this thing. So if you look in Ezra chapter 3 verse 8. I want you to notice the repetition of the number two in this. Okay? Uh, now in the second year, verse 8, of uh, their coming into the house of God at Jerusalem, in the second month began Zerubbabel the son of Shealtiel and Jeshua the son of Josadak and the remnant of their brethren, the priests and the Levites, and all that were come out of the captivity unto Jerusalem and appointed the Levites from, here it is, here's another one, 20 years old. 
Okay, from 20 years old and upward to set forward the work of the house of the Lord. Then said Jeshua with his sons and his brethren, Cadmiel and his sons, the sons of Judah, together to set forward the workmen in the house of God, the sons of Hinnadad, with their sons and their brethren, the Levites. And when the builders laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord. Now I'm going to stop right here. Okay, let me let me tell you where I'm going with this number two. Uh, it has multiple ideas. And the statement that I made a while ago is that right now God, God is laying the foundation for the millennial reign. It's been 2,000 years since Christ's first coming, roughly. Okay, I don't know exactly, but it's been roughly that time frame. So we're about to, ready it, to go into the third day, the, the millennial reign of Christ. And so this number two points to the establishment of the foundation through the Gentiles. Because... That to the twelve apostles, even though most of them were Jews, the twelve apostles were actually ministers of the Gentile age, the New Testament. Jews won't touch the New Testament. They won't read it. That's a Goyim Bible, they call it. And the word Goyim is like a trash word for anybody that's not a Jew. Okay, So the New Testament lays the foundation or is, is of the church age. Primarily, but not exclusively, but primarily to non-Jewish people, to the Gentiles. Does everybody follow me so far? Okay? So that's what this foundation is about. So it has to do with the Gentile age. I like this. This is one of my favorite things. Um, there's a place, I think it's in the book of Joshua, where they're going to march across Jordan. Um, oh, I love the imagery of this. And they took the Ark of the Covenant, and they took the Levite priest there, and they set them in the front. And they were going to start walking across Jordan River. And God specifically said that the Ark of the Covenant was to go first. And then exactly 2,000 cubits behind the Ark of the Covenant, Israel could come following in. And I looked at that and I just went, that's like the coolest thing I've ever seen. In the, well, and I always say that about a lot of things. Okay? But follow, the Ark of the Covenant represents God's mercy seat. It represents Christ on the cross because of the sprinkling of blood. So here it is. Two thousand, here's the, here's the God's mercy. And then 2,000 later, Israel can come into the promised land. Does everybody follow that so far? So we're talking about the age of the Gentiles. Okay? King James Bible is the only place in the whole world you're going to get this kind of stuff. All right? And if I'm stupid, I'll just blame it on the Bible. Amen? Okay. So anyway, but but then the number two has to do with well, it has to do like Christ's first coming, Christ's second coming. Okay, uh, it has to do with the old covenant and the new covenant. It has to do with two witnesses, and we have two witnesses in our Bible: the Old Testament and the New Testament. So I want you to follow this idea that the foundation of God's house is laid upon both covenants of the Scriptures. You cannot leave one out. Okay? It's, it's like you're, when we pour a foundation in this country, it's a, it's a concrete mixture. And if you take the aggregate out of that concrete, which is the gravel in there, what have you got? What have you got, Sterling? Okay? He just poured a sidewalk around his, around his back door to his, to his porch. I saw him out there, a big pile of gravel. What is that, one inch? Three quarter, okay, three quarter inch gravel, mixes his own concrete, throws it in there. You got to put that gravel in there. If you leave it out, you've got cement and lime. And when you walk on, I don't care how thick you pour it, over time, what's going to happen to it, Jim? It's going to crack. It's gonna, in fact, it'll turn to dust over time. In fact, grass will destroy it worse than anything. Get a, yeah, that's right. It'll grow right through it. And I want to tell you something. That if you leave out something out of this Bible, your foundations is shot. You just give it time. Amen? If there's one verse wrong in this Bible, foundation's wrong. If there's a word out of place, the foundation's faulty. And I want my life... To be built upon the best, strongest foundation. Because I'm going to tell you, you know what God's going to do? 
God's going to shake this whole world one of these days. How many of you believe that? Say amen. Did you know the Bible actually describes the actions of the earth during that time? It says it shall reel to and fro like a drunkard. The entire globe is going to move like this. And God says, I'm going to shake this place. And then whatever's left, that's what we're going to deal with. And I want my life built upon the most solid, strongest, most sturdy foundation that there is. I'm not going to leave the New Testament out and just stick with the law. I'm not going to leave the Old Testament out and just stick with grace. Grace without works of the law is dead. So you've got to have both testaments. And here, here's what we see a lot of. Okay? I'm going to just kind of relax for it. That was the bell, wasn't it? Okay? Here's what we see a lot of. Here we see a lot of people running around saying, I'm a Christian. Some of these people have, have, put, have ascribed so much of their ideas to the law that it's almost like they think the law is keeping them saved and keeping them right with God and keeping God blessing them. And that is a false doctrine. There is, on the other hand, people run around that's all about, well, it's, it's almost like, well, I got saved when I was 12. So God wrote it in the book. And I ain't doing nothing until he comes back or until I die. They probably won't say that because it makes them look bad. But the evidence of their lives suggests that they believe so much that once they get, quote unquote, saved, that they can just walk around and do whatever they want to, live however they want to. And they say, well, that's under the law. I don't have to do nothing because that's under the law. Okay? And you poor people that are going to church every Sunday and paying tithes and doing this and that and the other and trying to act right and dress right and live right and do all this stuff, they'll tell you, oh, you don't have to. You know what? Who was it? Somebody told me that they were working in a, in a hospital somewhere. And uh, they had, had just a lot of people on government, getting government money. And she was one of them. And she, well, she wasn't getting government money, but she was of these people. And they told her, they said, we just don't understand. She was a nurse at a hospital, and a lady come in, had something wrong with her. She said, I don't understand you. She said, what do you mean? She said, you're in here working every day and working overtime trying to make ends meet. We just sit at home. We just get money. We don't pay our bills. We don't have to do anything. And we just get money and money and money. And we don't do anything for it. We sit and shake our heads. I want to tell you, that's wrong. Okay? And I want to tell you, in a, in a solid, born-again believer, there will always be a healthy balance between God's grace and His law in your life. You will not believe that God's keeping you saved by your works of the law. But you will also never believe that as a born-again Christian, you can just forget about what God said in the Bible and still be saved. Amen? Amen? It's both of them together. It's the aggregate and the Portland cement working together in the concrete that's going to, that's going to make that thing last. By the way, just aggregate is gravel. And you cannot build a house. Because what happens to gravel? It'll spread out, slide off. Okay? It takes the working of both of them together. And, that, and that's what God is showing us through this. How many of you buy that? Say amen. amen. Faith without works is dead. Cement without aggregate won't hold up. Aggregate without cement won't hold up. Okay? Hope I explained that right. Let's go to prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for this Bible. Thank you for the wisdom in it. Lord Father, pattern our lives after what's in this book instead of us trying to pattern the book after our lives. Lord Father, it, help us to examine ourselves. Help us to examine our lives, our lifestyles, things we do, things we think, how we vote, how we eat, how we, how we have our money, how we raise our children. Lord, how, how, how we just do everything in the world, how we have church service here. Help us to pattern everything, God, after the foundation of the whole testimony of God in this book. Thank you for it, God. Thank you for what it says, for what it means. And Father, Lord, just lay a good foundation in our lives, we pray in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. We're going to be in Ephesians chapter 6 uh, again this morning. I want, to, I want to kind of try to finish what I started last Sunday morning. While you're turning there, I, I, got, a little, I got a little heavy heart. This It's not bad, but uh, just something I've been praying about all week. And this is not... 
This is not really for anybody here. So everybody here just plug your ears. And, no, just kidding. Um, last week, we got, uh, or I got, some comments on our service last week from people watching. Okay? And they were, they were kind of negative. Okay? Now, I'm not mad. I wasn't hurt. I didn't want to shoot somebody. Okay? And I'm not, I'm not going to be mean about what I say. Okay? I love, I love what this church is doing. I think God, God has given us a good thing here. I really do. Okay? He, he, he makes, believe, God makes my job here unbelievably easy. I mean, he really does. He just has made it unbelievably easy for me to do what I do here and for us to do what we do here. Uh, it's, it's a, it just comes natural. Uh, the Holy Ghost gives me things to say, gives me things to learn, and so on, and I appreciate that. We, we actually, when, when the idea came up of broadcasting our services live over the Internet, I, I went to this church with it. It wasn't my idea. I mean, it, I didn't want this to be just my decision or just what I wanted. And we agreed before we ever turned the camera on here, we agreed that we were going to be ourselves in this building. This is not a production that we're doing here. This is us. This, these, these are my people. These are my best friends. These are my family. And I don't know, I know of some churches where... The pastor is always against the church, and the church is always against the pastor. That We don't have that here that I'm aware of. We just don't have that here. And I don't feel like my congregation is some, some, somebody i got to rough up every Sunday just because I can. That, that's just not how it is here. Okay? Now, we make mistakes. And I trip and fall. Okay? And I'll try to make a joke about it if I do, to save the embarrassment. Okay? We don't play the instruments right sometimes. We don't sing all the right words sometimes. We make mistakes. Okay? We do things. I, I sometimes am neglectful and forgetful when it comes to things that need to be done during the church service and so on. That's, that's us. Okay? We're, we try hard. We're probably not going to be any better than what we, what we are right now. Okay? And I, I just want to say this. I'll say this in love. Okay? It would be like somebody on the internet calling me or writing me and say, Pastor Mike, that dress your wife had on last week was the ugliest thing I've ever seen in my life. Can you do, can you do something about that? Okay? Now, nobody has said that. That would make me mad. Okay? That would, I would get upset about that one. Okay, um, we're doing this because of this right here and what's in this book. And you're supposed to be watching us because of this right here. Okay, how we do things, the mistakes that we make. Okay, uh, whether I'm going to read from here or today we're going to read from there. It's the same thing. Okay, and I, I'm not I'm not trying to get on you. I'm just telling you, this is as good as it gets here. We're us, and I love you people, and I'm going to defend you. That's right. Sam's don't like this. I don't like that. Okay. Okay. We want to be a blessing to everybody that's watching us here. That's what we want to be. Okay, and if we need changing. God will change us. God will fix things. God will help us. So anyway, got your Bibles out. Say amen. amen. Ephesians chapter 6. We started this last week. Verse 12. Well, in fact, you know what? I want to go to verse 10. Um, because some, some things here we need to look at. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord in the power of His might. Not in your own power. Not in your own self-confidence, 
Not in your own, as some other Bibles put in there, self-control. I don't like that. The Bible, the King James will say temperance. You know what that means? Sterling knows what temperance means. Because he's worked with metal. And metal has to be tempered. And usually it's gone through the fire. Okay? The, the forger takes metal or glass, tempered glass, same thing. It's gone through the fire and then it's cooled quickly. Okay? And that's how you temper something. And temper is a process. Self-control, I want no part of in my life. Okay? I do, however, want God's temperance in my life. Can I hear you say amen? So it says, be strong in the Lord in the power of His might, not my strength. God is not using me because of my abilities. He's using me because of my weaknesses. You stop and think about that. He didn't call this church because of how mighty and how good we are and what kind of production we could put on and how we do this. and how. God did not call this church into this ministry because of all things. He called us into that because of our weaknesses, because of our frailties. Not because of the things we can do, but because of the things that we can't do that God is going to do through us. To show weak people that God is powerful enough to do what it is that they cannot do. Can I get an amen out of somebody? And really, this, this kind of this sermon deal that I'm talking about last Sunday and this Sunday is about our weaknesses. It's about weaknesses in that wall that I had up here a while ago. That wall that has been that is built around us as Christians, there is a wall around us to protect us. It's there to protect our souls. It's there to protect our, our marriages, our families. It's there to protect our church or our nation. It's there to protect us. And there are going to be weaknesses in areas of our life. And that is where we need Christ, not us, in those places. And that's ultimately, I mean, if you just want me to preach this in five minutes, I will. Read your Bible, pray every day, get more of Jesus in your life, and things will be pretty good. Let's all stand and be dismissed. Because that's it. Now, I'm, I am going to take the long way because that's what I like to do. And I'm going to show it to you from the scriptures. But ultimately, this is about God's power in our life and not our own power and self abilities and control and everything like that. It's not about that. It's about what God's going to do. So he says, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you, may be, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. And really what he's saying in verse 11 is that you cannot stand without the armor. You, in fact, you will not stand without. And, what, and stop and think about this. What is armor? It's a wall of protection around your body. Think about it. You, the helmet is a wall of protection around your head. The shield is a, is a movable barrier of protection that you can put just about anywhere. The breastplate of righteousness is a barrier of protection to protect the vital organs. The, the, your feet shod is to protect your feet from terrain that you normally would not be able to walk on. And on and on and up, that whole armor of God is all about protection. And I think a Christian needs to be protected, don't you? Needs to be protected. I think a marriage needs to be protected. The devil will, will lob fiery darts. He will try to destroy your marriage. He'll try to bust it up. And it needs to be protected with the armor of God. You know what the helmet of salvation is? The Bible. You know what the shield of faith is? The Bible. You know what the sword of the Spirit is? The Bible. Amen. You know what the breastplate of righteousness is? The Bible. The Bible. It's all right here. It's, when we wield this Bible, we are going to be protected from the things the devil's trying to do to us. Can I get an amen out of somebody? Okay? So, so that, this is just how this works. And so, but if you do not have these things present, you will fall. That's just how it works. I have, I have yet to see... Two warring armies meet together in the field of battle and slap each other like Curly and Moe. Okay? I don't see that. I see swords and spears and everything else going after the vital parts of the body in order to destroy the guy that you're fighting. Does that make sense to everybody? That's how it works. 
So even the armor of God itself is a wall of salvation that God's build, God builds around us to protect us. Let me go back to these verses. In fact, let me, let me read this. For we wrestle not, verse 12, against principal, flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, and against the spiritual wickedness in high places. Let me go back to these verses here. Uh, Isaiah 26, 1. And that day shall this song be sung in the land of Judah. We have a strong city. Salvation will God appoint for walls and bulwarks. And so a wall around you is God saving you from the attack of the enemy. Isaiah 60, verse 18. What did I do here? Violence shall no more be heard in the land, wasting nor destruction within thy borders, but thou shalt call thy walls salvation. So we illustrated here, this is a wall of protection. This is your shield of faith right here, around, surrounding you, an individual believer. Ultimately, when you get to heaven, you will not be able to, ask, you will not be able to blame your wife for your faulty Christian lifestyle. You'll not be able to blame your husband. You'll not be able to say, well, my mom and daddy didn't live right, and I was just a product of my environment, and so God, why don't you just take me into heaven anyway, even though I lived like a dog? It's really my mom and daddy's fault. How many, how many Christians here today grew up in a non-Christian home? Raise your hand. It's not mom and daddy's fault. It's yours. God tried to build a wall of protection around you. You can't blame everybody else. You work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, the Bible says. It's your responsibility. Then we have a home or a marriage or a family. Things like that. These are things that God is trying to protect. Now, if you're stupid enough to go to bed at night with your front door, your back door, and all your windows open... In this world that we live in right now, okay, now I know back 70 years ago, that's how everybody went to bed. Front door, back door open, windows open, no big deal. Don't, I don't recommend it anymore. Can I hear you say amen? It's your job to protect. So when we go to bed at night, we shut all the windows, we lock the doors, deadbolt them. Got a dog sitting by the door, hopefully, that will do what a dog is supposed to do. Bark. And then hopefully we won't wake up and say, shut up, you stupid dog, go to sleep, as somebody's walking through our house. Can I get an amen out of somebody? You're to protect your home. This church needs protection. Amen? Needs protection. We have... We have a situation in this church this morning. I'm not going to draw a lot of attention to it. I will just tell you that right now this church is protected from a physical threat in this building right now. Okay? We're in pretty good shape. We actually had a guy, Rose's cousin, he was a security guy from Missouri Baptist he come down here and he said, well, you should do this, Pastor, you should do this and do this. And he said, oh, Pastor, he said, I see up here a door. That way if someone comes in and they're a threat, you can go running out that door like a little girl. <laughs> he didn't actually say that, but I said, no, that's not what I'm going to do. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Honey, save me. That's not what I'm going to do. I'm going to run down to her. And protect her, Amen. even with even with my own body. I'm going to protect her. I'm going to be a wall of salvation for her. How many of you men agree with that? Say amen. Do the same thing with your kids, too, by the way. Or nation. And I preached on that last night. I won't get off on that this morning. But anyway, you, you, you understand the situation our nation is in right now. You understand the, the benefit of protecting. Okay, you get it. All right. So then we have, we have the invaders into that wall. The principalities, powers, rulers of darkness, spiritual wickedness. And I'll talk about that in a little bit later on. Uh, it, it, Satan wants to sit in the seat. There's a verse here. Uh, let's see here. Yeah, Isaiah chapter 7, verse 5. Look at this. 
Because Syria, Ephraim, and the son of Remaliah have taken evil counsel against thee, saying... There is evil counsel going on right now. If you don't believe in conspiracy theories, you should believe in at least one. That there is a conspiracy to take over the whole world. There is one. It's in the Bible. Okay? It's in the Bible. It's there. There's a conspiracy to change America from having the foundation of Jesus Christ in us to something other than that. There is a conspiracy to do that. There are people actively talking about it. As we speak, there are people talking about how they're going to do it. There are principalities and powers and rulers of darkness and spiritual wickedness that are counseling together to find to figure out how they can destroy Bethel Church, how they can destroy Mike Hoggard, how they can destroy his marriage, how they can destroy his family. And that's just and that's for no other reason other than I am a born again Christian. That believes the Bible. It's not the, any ex, exalted position that I have with anybody or any influence that I have or anything. Hey, if the devil can cut me down, God will raise somebody else up. Amen. Hey, don't you believe that? Say amen. When God took Elijah out, who took over? Elisha. And did you know Elisha did twice as much as Elijah did because he had a double portion on him? So if, if I'm going out of here, God will just raise somebody else up. But the reason why the devil will want to do harm to me is because I believe the Bible and I have the blood of Jesus Christ on me and I have an inheritance that he wants. That's why. So it doesn't matter if it's Mike Hoggard or Courtney Hoggard. It doesn't matter if it's me or if it's even Jared back here. It doesn't matter. God wants or the devil wants you because of what you represent. Can I hear you say amen? So, evil counsel, let us go up against Judah and vex it. We talked about that last Sunday. And let us make a breach therein for us and set a king in the midst of it, even the son of Tabiel. In other words, there was already a king there. His name is King Jesus. But we want to get him off the throne and get our boy in to reign over that. But here's how we have to do it. We have to vex you. And then we have to make a breach in you. And that's what those holes represented. Uh, Proverbs chapter 15 verse 4. The Bible says a wholesome tongue is a tree of life. But uh, by the way, here is the tree of life right here. And it's got a wholesome tongue in it. Somebody say amen. That means it's clean. That means it's not full of filthiness and vileness. That means it's not corrupt. That means its words are pure and, and wholesome. So a wholesome, uh, a wholesome tongue is a tree of life. But watch this. But perverseness therein is a breach where? In the spirit. A breach in the spirit. And so perverseness will come in. There, the devil will try to pervert godly authority in your life. He'll try to turn a marriage upside down to where the woman is the one who rules the roost and calls the shots. That is a perversion of God's way. Can I get an amen out of somebody? Powers will come in, and instead of God having power in your life and you be, God having control of your life, the devil will come in and he will pervert God's power in your life and turn it into something else. Let me tell you, let me tell you what God's, everybody, people go to church every Sunday. There are people in this town, in church right now, and they'll come out and say, oh, the power of God fell in this place. Why? There was people speaking in tongues, and there was people rolling on the floor, and there was people dancing and hooping and hollering, and oh, we felt amazing presence in there, and they call that the power of God. Let me tell you what the power of God, when it really falls down on a Christian, is that he'll drop to his knees, he'll repent. He'll weep and sob over his miserable condition. He won't be dancing up and ground until he gets down on the floor and weeps over his sin. Somebody say amen. The power of God is what changes somebody from an old, dirty, filthy, rotten sinner into a saint. Somebody say amen. That's the power of God. And the devil wants to come in and pervert that by giving you a false power or a pseudo power in your life or something that has power over you other than the power of God. That's the perversion of it. Rulers of darkness. God wants to shine light inside of the, of, of the heart of a Christian, inside the heart of a nation or a church or whatever. God wants to shine light. The devil comes in selling darkness and people buy it. He comes in selling darkness and bringing darkness and he calls it light. But it's not. It's darkness. 
One of the things, and Alicia helped me with this one time. I kept doing all this study on what we got a little thing in your brain called the pineal gland. And in the new age and in all this stuff, you hear them talk about, oh, you're going to have your pineal gland activated and it's going to be an awakening and you're going to have enlightenment when your pineal gland is activated. And I'm going, well, I don't know anything about that. Alicia, what is a pineal gland? She said, this is really interesting, Dad. There's a little thing in your brain called the pineal gland. And when it gets dark, it reacts to light. And when it gets dark outside, that's when your pineal gland is activated in darkness. And when the darkness comes, your pineal gland starts secreting melatonin. And you know what melatonin does? <sighs> boy, I'm, I'm, boy, I'm sleepy. And about 8, 30, 9 o'clock at night, 9.30, you're ready to go to bed. You know why? Because the lights went off. And you go lay down and you go to sleep. And what wakes you up the next morning at stinking 5 o'clock in the morning, because this time of year, that's when the sun pops out. Is that sunlight is going through the thinness of your eyelids, going through the receptors of your eyes, and the pineal gland is receiving that light, and it's starting to shut down now and stop putting out that melatonin. That's why as the day goes on, you become more and more awake because you're burning through that chemical in your body. Isn't that neat? God designed us that way. They're telling you that when this thing is activated, you will have an awakening, and it's light. It's the exact opposite. It's a perversion of God's way. Be careful. I'm saying this to this church, and I'm saying it out there. Be careful of churches offering you experiences. That is, and things that they call light in the Spirit of God. That is a perversion of of God's way. Now, I like it when an old sinner gets saved and he gets happy. Somebody say amen. The experience came after God's working. The experiences did not bring on God's working. What's well, something to remember? Okay? And then spiritual wickedness. God wants us to be people of righteousness. And we take spiritual righteousness in our inner soul and it's perverted into wickedness. Does everybody follow that now so far? Okay? Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 7. But it came to pass that when Sanballat and Tobiah and the Arabians and the Ammonites and the Ashdodites heard that the walls of Jerusalem were made up and that the breaches began to be stopped, they were very wroth. Now I want you to listen to me now for a minute. Everybody in here, we talked about this last Sunday, everybody in here is aware, or you should be aware, in your life of your weaknesses. How many of you know what they are? Okay, I know what mine are. Okay? Um, that burrito I had for supper last night, I put it on Facebook. Burrito Mexicano, Chris. Chris is going, oh, yeah. Okay? That is a weakness to a diet. Amen? See, my wife and I know this stuff. Okay? Because we're, we're, we're trying to lose weight. Okay? My body is in the maintenance stage now. I'm having to go to the doctor like every month for something new. And a lot of it has to do with 300 pounds sitting on me. And I've got to lose weight. There's only one problem. Food. <laughs> and burrito Mexicano. And Oreo cookies. Oreos made me mad, by the way. Did you see the gay pride Oreo they made? It's got like six layers and all these. It's got the gay pride colors into it. Anyway, that's listen. That's our weakness. And sometimes she will be strong, and I'll say, "Honey, let's go out to eat." No, I'm trying to lose weight, and I'll say, "Okay, fine." And sometimes I'll say, "Honey, let's go out," and she's in the car before I get eat out. Okay. And I'm, we're just being honest here. And so let's, 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 that's a light thing with us. It's not a sin to eat supper. What I'm doing is, is I'm telling you a, an outside thing because there are things with me that I'm not going to tell you that are weaknesses. I know them. She knows them. God knows them. And so do principalities, powers, rulers of darkness, and spiritual wickedness in high places. They know them. 
So watch this. This story here, what happened? This story here in Nehemiah was when they came back to, the, to, the, to Judah, they said, guys, first thing we've got to do is we've got to rebuild this wall or we will be in trouble. So they come back and they start, well, look at what they were doing. They were, they were stopping up the breaches. They were stopping up the places where the enemy was going to come in. And here's the enemy, Sanballat, Tobiah, and the Arabians, Ammonites, and Ashdodites. That's the Philistines, by the way. They were looking at that thing, and they were going, if they build those breaches, we'll never be able to keep them under control. Sound familiar? So here's what happens. Boy, I tell you what, I mean the preacher's laying it out to you, and you're under conviction. And you come down and you go, oh God now, oh God, help me, I don't want to do this. Oh God, I need your help. God, I need your grace. God, give me strength to stand up against the wiles of the devil. God heard your prayer. So did the devil. And he's watching you do things in your life that's stopping up the breaches in your life so he can't get in. He's watching you do this. And he is conspiring against you while you're doing it. Does that make sense to everybody? You say, all right, you get up from the altar. I'm going to read the Bible now three times a day. Oh, I just feel so alive. Monday, you read the Bible two times. Tuesday, you read it once. Wednesday, well, I got busy. See how it worked? Let me, t- let me tell you what that is. Okay, they're going to try to hinder the work. It's called strongholds. They will go to where the weaknesses are, where the work needs to be done, and they will set up camp right there in a stronghold to keep you from getting strength in that wall for your salvation. Does that make sense, everybody? How do you like my high-end, professional-grade, quality graphics up here? I know how to draw circles. Okay? So watch. Let me just deal with these very quickly. Okay? Not everybody in here is a luster. Not everybody here is into false Bibles and witchcraft and things like that. But let's deal with pride. Let's deal with rebellion and pride because that's what principalities deal with. Spiritual rebellion or spiritual pride. Pride in your own righteousness. You, you wore a suit to church on Sunday. Ladies, you wore a nice dress. And if we're not careful, we'll let that build up pride in us to where we think now that we think that God is going to bless us because we're dressed the right way. And I haven't yet preached the message on biblical dress, but I will. There are ways to cover this body in the Bible. And I'm not going to take away from that, but I will tell you that here's, what, here's the natural state of, of sinful man. Is that when we start doing things the right way, immediately we start getting proud about it. And there are even whole churches that are nothing about how you dress the right way and how you comb your hair the right way and how you do everything the right way and it's all right. And those churches are not being used by God. Do you know why? They're full of pride. They'll they'll make everybody think that the reason why God is blessing us as a church is because we have these high standards. And that is not true. It's not true. Show it to me in the Bible. It's not there. In New Testament Christianity, God does not bless you for how well you do. He blesses you because of his love for you. And you fell upon him and said, God, it's your mercy that saved me, not anything else. Or we'll get pride in our marriage. Okay? I think husbands ought to act the way the Bible calls husbands to act. And I've experienced this in my life. When I send a text to my wife or I give her a little kiss and rub her shoulders and I'm nice to her for a whole day. A whole day now I'm nice to my wife. I will pat myself on the back. That's what's keeping my marriage together. Now husbands, you're required in the scripture. Tell your wife you love her. Send her flowers. 
rubber back, be nice to... That's a biblical requirement. But I can tell you that if I go three days running being nice to my wife, I guarantee you the fourth day I'm going to do something stupid. And God is not holding my marriage together on my benefits or my, my strength. God is holding my marriage together because God has decided to hold my marriage together. And, it's, and we have fallen, Lisa and I have fallen together upon the grace of Almighty God. She has her strengths. She has her weaknesses. I have my strengths. I have my weaknesses. You know what my weaknesses serve to do? Remind me that I don't always have the strengths. To keep me from being proud. But here's one thing that's a very dangerous thing. In fact, to me, the most dangerous thing in the world for a Christian to be is proud. Let the queers be proud. Gay pride... Let them have all the pride they want to. They'll get what's coming to them one of these days. Let God's people be humble. Let God's people be submissive and to be servants to all. But a stronghold of the devil will be placed into our lives of our pride of what we're doing or how we are. And God will, and it's a, it really is a weakness in our life and it's not a strength. Let's look at this other one. Powers. Okay, magic, occult, witchcraft, media, and addictions. Magic, witchcraft, occult, we don't deal with a lot of that here, hopefully, young people. Video games, TV shows, comic books. We went to a bookstore the other night up in the mall, we was up at the mall. And went into a book, and I make it a point to go to the teen and adolescent section of these big bookstores here to find out what these kids are reading. And I took pictures of them. The stuff that they have being written for them to be put into their minds, it is no wonder that we're in the shape we're in in this country. But I'll tell you that that really is a byproduct of the Bible having already been gone out of their lives. They're not being taught biblical stories and biblical morals anymore. They're being taught witchcraft and, and how girls can fall in love with dead people. Vampires. That's what's going into their minds. And if you think that's just harmless fun, you're crazy. As a mom and dad, there's something wrong with you. When you let your kids feed on that garbage, that's not right. And here's what, and what, you know what it is? They say, well, they like that. They're reading. Let me tell you something. The devil has built a stronghold in their life. Ask, take it away from them. Watch what happens. When you go in their room and start taking all their stuff out, watch what happens. You will see a little devil in your house through your child. That is a stronghold. That's the evidence that there's a stronghold right there. I'm going to tell you, let me tell you the evidence of God working in your child is when they come to you bringing the books and the tapes and the, the tapes. The CDs and the DVDs and stuff like that and lay it down and say, Mom, I don't want that stuff anymore. I, God's dealing with me about it. I don't want this stuff anymore. Do something, Throw it away or do something with it. Get it out of here. That's the evidence that God's really working in your child. And I want to tell you something. It's with children and it's with adults as well. I put media up there because I want to tell you something. A stronghold of the devil is through the eyes and through the ears. His, and I'm not saying watching TV is wrong. What I'm saying to you is, is that there are things on that thing that ought not be on a Christian home's TV box. Should not be there. The movies, HBO should not be in your house. Should not be in your house. That represents the worst that can be on television right now. I won't even talk about the satellite adult channels and things like that. That should never be there. But you should never be subscribed to that stuff. You're just asking for trouble is what you're doing. You're asking for trouble. But the, the films, the TV shows, the talk shows, the news things, I'll tell you, you ought to be careful what news you're watching. And I'm not an advertisement for this or that or the other, but most of those guys are lying through their teeth. Okay? I'm just kind of telling you how it is. 
They represent strongholds in the mind of a Christian. And no wonder about half of church people are going to vote for somebody that's pro-abortion, pro-sodomite, pro-this, pro-that. They're going to vote for somebody and put them in office like that. You know why? Because they got a little stronghold of a political party or a union hall meeting or a, or a TV show or a talk show or whatever it is. They got a little stronghold in their life telling them what, what it is to do. Tell them and it's something that's not true. That's a stronghold. So let's just deal with the adults first and then we'll deal with young people. Okay? TV shows, I'm not going to tell you what to watch and what not to watch. That is not my job. It is not my job to go through the TV guide. Do they even print TV guide magazine anymore? I don't know. It's not my job to go through the TV guide and post something on here on the walls of the church that says, now, if I, don't, I better not catch anybody watching this TV show right here. That's not my job. Because if I can tell you what to watch and what not to watch, then you're doing it because of me. And you're not doing it for God. When God, when the Holy Ghost begins to, as you're watching a TV show and the Holy Ghost is saying, you know, take a look at that now. Tell me, is that, is that right? And I've had to eliminate certain television shows out of my watching schedule because the Holy Ghost said, Mike, that's not right. Mike. Listen to that. You just, pre- you just preached on that Sunday. So here you are laughing at it. God, you're right. Get it off of there. Because it represents a stronghold. Okay? Music and things like that. Friends. The devil will send you friends. Amen? The devil will send you friends. He'll even send you friends that go to church. There was a young lady that I grew up with in church here. Thought she was a good, solid, young Christian lady. She, she was taught the same thing I was here. Okay? She grew up. We both became adults. Had children and everything like that. And what happened was the devil introduced a, a spiritual stronghold in her life of a relative of hers. That was into this tongues talking and manifestations and everything else. And she was gone. I mean, she, she wasn't in there but just a few months. And boom, out. Gone. Just like that. Strongholds of friends, relationships. Okay? Family ties. The devil will build strongholds inside of there to keep you from serving God the way you're supposed to be serving God. That's exactly what he'll do. Strongholds of, uh, of media influences. Now I want to deal with you kids for a minute. Okay? Lady Gaga should not be heard by your ears. Um, Katy Perry grew up in church, girls. She grew up in church. She learned how to do what she's doing on a church stage. She learned how to sing and perform in a church. This is why I'm really not interested in putting on a big production every Sunday. But she learned how to do that in church. So she gets famous now. And I've had to deal with her a couple times. And there was one video somebody sent me. I won't tell you what. I, I said, I can't watch them. It was so vulgar and nasty, the things that she was doing in this video. Then she comes out with, I kissed a girl. Can I tell you the hidden secret of America, the American family? More and more teenage girls are turning into lesbians and bisexuals than we want to admit. Why? Because of the influence, the strongholds that are being built in their lives. Here this girl is telling everybody about how she kissed a girl and she liked it. And here is a 12-year-old girl now fantasizing about what it would be like. And they're having sleepovers. And you think, well, there's no boys here, so it'll be okay. Not anymore. And that song's just just driving the, driving the idea in. And then she has to get on there and she had, had to admit... In an interview, 
that she, more than likely, she believes she probably sold her soul to the devil to get where she is right now. Which is really factually incorrect because the devil already had it. Amen. That's why you had to be bought and paid for. Amen. By Jesus Christ. But that's who she is. And this is what's being listened to. And I, I can't even go beyond that. And young people, if you think that this is not really hurting you, then let your mom and dad go through your room tomorrow. Or today after church, before you have a chance to go in and sanitize it. Let them go in there. Hand them your phone. Give mom and dad your phone. Here, here, dad, mom. You, you have my permission to go look through anything I got on my phone here. See, here's the thing. When you know the devil's got a stronghold in your life is when God's righteousness wants to take it away. There's a fight going to go on. There is going to be a fight going on over that stronghold. A little war is going to break out. That's how you know. Okay? Parents, get involved. I just got an email from a lady that and I'm just I'm just kind of teaching and talking. We probably won't get all, even through all this. I thought I'd be done today. I just got an email from a lady uh, yesterday, day before something like that, wanting us to pray for their granddaughter. So they came to her and said, we just have a, a beautiful granddaughter, but she she ha has befriended these gothic girls at school. And she said. That uh, we w w wanted to make her feel at home and we we're trying to teach her, t take her to church, teach her about Jesus, things like that. And they said they actually caught her watching videos online. And she they they were just amazed that their daughter, their granddaughter, her main line of interest was animals. And I'm not talking about she wanted to be a zookeeper. 13, 14 year old girl already in bondage to that kind of stuff. You say, well, we shouldn't talk about that. I'm not going into specifics, but I'm telling you, this is America. This is who we're neighbors to. This is, this is what's infiltrating our children and our grandchildren. And I'm going to, I'm going to say it as decently as I possibly can, but I want to warn you, moms and dads and young people, it is a very, very bad place we live in right now. And the strongholds that are coming after our young people is going after them at a younger and a younger and a younger and a younger age. And it's worse than you can possibly imagine. We're not talking about Junior uh, looking at a Playboy magazine that some kid brought to school. We're talking about something that is far worse and far more disgusting than that going on, maybe even inside of our own homes right now. And these represent powers, strongholds. Actually, it's part of spiritual weakness. But anyway, the, the addictions that we have, uh, uh, different things like that, they are, they are powers working at us. And they will, build, they will set up shop and they'll build themselves a little fort in your life. And they will fight you tooth and nail about getting rid of them. I mean, fight hard to keep themselves positioned in a place in your life so that you will be forever weak and you will be destroyed. They will set their king up in your life at the end. I mean, let us stop kidding ourselves. Sister Bernice, we've been here a long time. Okay. I started coming here in 1974. You were here before that. How many, how many young people, how many adults have we seen coming in and out of the doors of this church, Sister June, that right now will not, they're not in church. They're not serving the Lord. They're not coming back. You know why? Strongholds. Strongholds of pride. Strong, strongholds of, of hatred or envy. Strongholds of different things in their life. And they're not coming back to church. They're not. 
because the strongholds have set up shop in their life the house of God and keeping them from getting right with God. Have I said that plain enough for everybody? You see how it works? Okay, just because you like it, that doesn't mean it's right. Because what we like, we like to justify. Don't we? I could justify the China buffet. Which, I started ordering it in now because every time I go there, Lisa calls me for some reason. She calls it, where are you at? <laughs> hey, you know what that is? That's God watching over me. Young people, I love you guys. I do. I love you with a, I mean, a pure love. Okay? Your mom and dad are not your enemies. They're not supposed to be. They're supposed to be your friends. And I am 46 years old. And I love it when I know my wife is looking over my shoulder. I don't have a problem with that in the world. And I'm a full-grown adult man. And I love it when I know my wife's looking over my shoulder. Young people, they're not supposed to be your enemies. They're supposed to be your friends. They're supposed to help you. Okay? And parents, that doesn't mean that you have to go in with a bulldozer either. Okay? But sit down with your young people and say, let, let, let's do some cleanup here. And I'll give you the chance to do it first before I, before I go in after you. But let's clean some things up around here. Let's, let's ask God for some help and for some strength. And let's clean up, as a family, let's clean up our TV watching. Let's just make an agreement then in our house, if there's a sodomite on TV, it goes off or goes to something else. We'll watch, we'll watch the Weather Channel for 24 hours. In fact, that, you, could, you know what? You could just start right there and say, on this television, there will not be a sodomite. Start right there. Start right there. And see what God will do in your life. You see, we're, I don't want to leave the God equation out here. He will actually fight for you. So you know what? This deal with Sanballat and Tobiah and everything like that, while they're building, that, building up the, the things, you know what they did? This is one of the neatest things in the whole Bible. They had the sword here, and they were laying bricks with this hand. They were doing what Paul said. They were walking circumspectly. You know what that means? They were looking for the enemy to come because they knew it could be just around the corner. And you know, I'm going to tell you what, you know what that sword is, don't you? It's the King James Bible. I just say the NIV dull one. I just say that New English version butter knife. <laughs> I said the sharper than any two-edged sword King James Bible. Let that be your guide. Let it be your, your, your model for things. And if God says don't have it on, if the Word of God says don't have it on, you don't have it on. If the Word of God says don't listen to it, you don't listen to it. If the Word of God says don't hang around these people, then don't go hang around these people. Can I get somebody to say amen? Amen. I'm, listen, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to quit right here. And I haven't got into the other stuff. But I just want us to stop here and think about these strongholds in our lives. And they are strong, aren't they? They're strong. There's no doubt about it. I got a God that's stronger. I, in fact, I got a God, watch this now, that won't even ask me to fight him. You know what he does? You know what he always did through the Old Testament? Especially in this deal with, with uh, who was it, Jehoshaphat? He said, Jehoshaphat, he said, I got this. He said, in fact, won't you guys go up there, up on this hill, and have an old-fashioned dinner on the ground and a, and a church singing up on the hill, and I'll fight the battle for you. And that's exactly what God did. And by the way, the battles were all fought at the cross. Amen. Somebody say amen. The battles were fought at the cross. You lay these things at the cross, young people, they're gone. Okay? I want us to pray, every head bowed and every eye closed. And I'm not going to ask you to raise hands or nothing like that. And I'm, I'm going to, the altars are here. And uh, if you want to use them, use them. You might need them. Might, it might have been one of those weeks where you just know what, this is an altar week right here. 
That just in your in your mind, in your heart right now, you, God, the Holy Ghost, has been dealing with you about an issue in your life or two or three, an issue in your life. And you just right now, you just say, you know what, God, it's, I know exactly what it is and you know what it is and the devil knows what it is. And God, there are strongholds in my life. And just the ones that we dealt with today, God, are enough to deal with. God, deal with me about these issues in my life. Again, this is open up here if you want to come. Some have come. Here it is right here. God, here's the strongholds in my life. Go fight for me or I'm going to lose this thing. God, will you help? Father, I thank you in Jesus' name for the multitude of mercy that you've had on me and that you've had on these people. And Lord, it just every now and then, God, we've got to be reminded of things that are just rotten filthiness in our lives. God, we have to be reminded that the things we're watching, people we're hanging around, Stuff we're just loading in our minds. They're strongholds. It's what they are. And we know they are, God, because we just seem like we just can't live without them. They fight us, Lord, every time we just think, well, maybe I can do without this. And, Father, we want to be strong. And, Lord, we know, God, that when we shed off this flesh and we're made in your image, God, we will be. But, Father, Lord, we would rather have it that you would be strong in our weakness so that you would get the praise and the glory out of it. And so, Father, Lord, I'm asking God on behalf of my my people, my family, my church, my friends, those that are watching this morning. God, you begin to deal with us, God, about issues in our life, things that, Lord, that we're just we're hoping, God, that we can just neglect them. And hoping that we can still get by. God, help us to see the ultimate danger, Lord, of what could happen. If, if, if all we do is just sit on the sidelines and don't worry about it. God, deal with us right now, Lord, about our, about our strongholds. Deal with us, Lord, this week about them. Deal with, Lord, issues. I mean, specific things, God, that are not pleasing in your sight. God, would you just help us? Thank you, God, Lord, for your mercy. Lord, you could have shot us all and got us all out of the way, God. You could have, you, Lord, we, we deserve to be in hell. But your mercy has sustained us, and it's your grace and your mercy, Lord, that's teaching us today things that we probably already knew. We just need to be reminded of every now and then. So, Lord, thank you for your grace. Lord, our young people, our children. Especially, God, them today. They need it more than we do. Lord, would you help them? Help them to have a heart to where mom and daddy don't have to tell them what to do and how to live anymore. They just want to do it. Lord, give them that heart. Please, God. This is the future. Please give them that heart. Thank you, God, for meeting with us today, for hearing our prayers. Thank you, Lord, for preaching it to us, Father. We love you. We ask for your grace and your blessing in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Hello, folks. Pastor Mike here. And sometimes you'll hear me talk about during a sermon or a teaching about being saved or salvation. And some people just don't know what that is. And I just want to share with you from the Bible what it means to be saved. The Bible tells us in Romans 3.23 that all have sinned. And come short of the glory of God. I'm not here as a pastor or here as part of this church because I'm better than anybody. I'm here because I'm a sinner. I have done things that have violated the laws of God. And uh, I need to be sorry for those. The Bible says in Romans 6.23, For the wages of sin is death. We all have what's coming to us as a result 
of our sinfulness and as a result of us breaking God's law. And some people say, well, you know, it says death. Yeah, we're all going to die. But that doesn't necessarily mean hell. The Bible also says the wicked shall be turned into hell and all the nations that forget God. See, the Bible teaches and we teach here in a literal place called hell. We believe in a literal place of uh, joy and peace and eternal life that is in heaven, that God gives to those that are saved. But we also believe in e eternal hell, a place of everlasting torment to those who reject God's gift of salvation. So we know that we have sinned. We know that the wages of that sin is death. But the Bible says in the same verse, Romans 6.23, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. John 3.16 says... For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever, including me and including you, would believe in Him, should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. Being saved means being born again and being saved from the wrath of God's judgment upon us. What we deserve, what we have coming, as a result of our sinfulness. So the Bible says in 1 John 1, 9, that if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And I don't know about you, but one of the greatest things, in fact, the greatest thing that has ever happened to Mike Hoggard is the fact that I confessed my sins to God and God forgave and still does forgive every one of of my sins. Romans 10 says it this way. It says, If we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in our heart that God raised Him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. What it means to be saved is that God has, has cornered you with the result and the things, the effects of your sin in your life. The Holy Spirit is bearing down on your soul right now and you feel the guilt of Almighty God upon you and God is trying to make you so that you just like our parents used to do. God used to, is trying to make you sorry for your sins. We confess those sins to God. We repent of them, which means that we don't want sin to be a part of our life any longer. And we simply ask God, God, you take over the reins in my life and you be the Lord of my life. And you give me the promise of your Holy Spirit in me so that I know that when I die, I'm going to heaven now. And I want you to understand that God offers salvation to you today if you will accept His free gift. Trust in the Lord. Repent of your sins. And the Bible says, Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. If you watch any of our videos or at some point and God is just dealing with you, you bow your head and you call upon the name of the Lord and ask God to forgive you and ask God to save you. And God promised in His Word, and God has never broken His Word, God promised in His Word that He would forgive you and that He would save you and heaven would be your eternal home. I hope and pray that one of these days I see you in heaven and you get to see me in heaven. God bless you. Bye-bye.